Welcome to Land Talk, the program that tells the stories of people on the land. My name is Matt Sykes. Today we've come to meet Rod Stubbings, an amateur astronomer who lives in the foothills of the Streslick Ranges in West Gippsland, Victoria. Rod, thanks for having us. It's okay. How did you become an amateur astronomer? It was basically through a um, magazine. I um, had a look at, um, had a picture showing Saturn and Jupiter, and um, I thought that'd be really cool to look at that. So I went out and purchased a little 65 mil Tesco telescope, mm -hmm. and waited for when it arrived. I actually unpacked it and took it out, went outside and um, tried to find the Saturn and Jupiter, yeah. and didn't have a clue where it was. <laughs> tried to focus on the stars, and it was just, it was just no good. So. Yeah. Um, so then I thought, well, um, I'll go to go to, I went to the news agents mm. and um, I bought a book on astronomy without a telescope. So they basically told me where the, um, what the stars, the name of the stars, where the Southern Cross was, okay. the pointers, and then I learnt my way around the whole sky. Right. And eventually I found uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Right. Yeah, so basically self-taught. Yeah. Yeah. Just and, to, and, and over time you've chosen to specialise in variable stars. Mm. What what are they? The variable stars are stars that change in brightness, mm -hmm. whether it's either whether from chemical itself in the star mm -hmm. or our stars go in front of one another, so they eclipse and all that sort of thing. So okay. two types of, of variables and then also there's all subtypes and explosive types and okay. stars that disappear and that sort of thing. So yeah. and I start to concentrate on the explosive type of variable stars. Mm -hmm because the um, professionals were interested in that type of star at the time. So, yeah. Um, and why I sort of went that way, because I wanted to make some sort of contribution to science. So, yes. And every time you looked at a star, um, you record an observation, yes. and that, that went, in, went into science, because I was spending so much time outside, yes. I thought, well, I've got to put my time to better use. So, mm. And then I just um, went on to variable stars and been hooked ever since. Now, Rod, you've, you've got an observatory in your backyard and you've come to build your house in this very specific location. What prompted uh, this move? Yeah, it was sort of due to um, light pollution because um, I was based in Druin mm -hmm. and uh, the lights from the town were starting to affect the night sky, so mm. I chose to come out to a darker side. Yeah, and so I can see that, that it wouldn't affect my observing. So, mm. but then the irony is here is that um, uh, in front of the house you can see the increasing suburban development, yeah. and uh, you're also talk talking about the glow associated with each of these towns. Mm -hmm. What what do you see uh, unfolding as the development increases? Yeah, well, since I've been here, I've actually noticed um, all the light glow starting to increase. Mm. Um, so. This will be right here for quite a while, but um, it will in repeat in the night sky. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully they'll um, try and correct that with all the new subdivisions. And you put all these um, low cutoff lighting, which okay. actually directs the light down at the ground rather than out in the sky. Yes. Um, that's, that's what they really should be doing. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how does um, astronomy, how has it changed your perspective on the universe? Yeah, it gives you an appreciation of what's out there because mm. I have a bit of an idea of um, how big this place is mm. and you know, we're pretty insignificant compared to things that are out there. Mm. For instance, there's, um, I'd like to give you an idea on how big this one star is. Um, they're just uh, uh, one of the largest stars they've found so far. Um, it, it, if you uh, had an aeroplane and it flew across the diameter of the Earth, it takes about 14 and a half hours. Mm -hmm. And if the aeroplane flies across the diameter of our sun, mm -hmm. it takes 65 days. All right. And this star that just recently found is one of the largest stars, it takes only 400 years to fly across the diameter of the star. All right. And that's just one speck in millions of stars out there. So mm -hmm. that's pretty big, and that's just one speck out of the entire universe. So yeah. really, that's, the universe is a big place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the stars that we look at, how far away are they? Well, the closest star uh, to us is 4.3 light, 4 light years away, mm -hmm. Alpha Centauri. Mm -hmm. um, and then the brightest star in the sky, Sirius, that's 8 light years away. Mm -hmm. So basically, that's how long it's taking for the light to reach our eyes. Mm -hmm. So Sirius disappeared now, tonight, mm -hmm. 
it wouldn't notice it gone for another eight years because it's taken that long for the light to reach our eyes. So yeah. everything you see in space has already happened. Mm. So astronomy must really challenge your sense of, well, challenges all of our sense of, of time and, and space. Mm. Yeah, it does, yeah. yeah. How, how has uh, astronomy actually influenced your, your life patterns and, and your, you know, your daily routine? Um, yeah, a great deal actually. So, oh, 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 I just think about think about the universe and the stars. Like, I sort of probably got a one track mind sort of thing. But, mm, mm. Um, yeah, I just generally just like the whole concept of it. Mm. Night time. Um, I sort of tell a lot of people about the the night sky, mm. and um, I'm actually starting to get people to look up. Cause mm. Every time they see me, it was a cl- and they say. It was a clear night last night, Rod. I bet you outside. So I've actually got people starting to look at the sky themselves so, yeah. and noticing things. Or they ring up. They'll say to me, "Oh, what's that um, bright thing in the sky last night?" So, so they're actually starting to notice. There's only a handful of amateur astronomers left in the southern hemisphere that are observing uh, variable stars, and you must feel some kind of responsibility to pass that knowledge on to future generations. Um, how, how do you plan to go about that? Yeah, well, um, I've had a few school groups up lately to, um, and I'll show them through um, objects in the sky and that. Mm. And I know there's a lot of interest out there, mm. so um, at the moment I'm building a large observatory mm. uh, to cater for that. So, and mm. I want to, say, get funding to try and get a bigger telescope. Mm. If you're going to invite the, um, people up, yes. a nice big telescope to look through it, it sort of yeah. can be more appealing. So. For the future, that's where I'm, I'm looking at to invite the public up and, and mm. just to show people the nice guy because there is a lot of interest out there. Mm. And and what kind of things can people do? Can, what what kind of things could a, could suburban parents do with their kids in their in their own backyards? Well, even with um, binoculars, you can actually see Jupiter's moons with binoculars. Okay. So, um, even just visually, just look up and people don't know where the Southern Cross is and the pointers. Mm. And it's the Milky Way, and also there's also um, you can actually see like a shape of an emu along the Milky Way which starts at the Southern Cross and okay. there's a dark band runs right down the Milky Way and, and it actually looks like an emu and when I point it out they say, oh yeah I can see that sort of thing. And, yeah. um, and they can see um, constellations, like mm. you can see the shape of the scorpion, mm. they're quite obvious, uh, different coloured stars, it's mm. red mm. giant orange stars and yeah, the older stars that have been um, starting to die and the real white ones are the young stars. Mm. So, just visually, there's a lot to look at. Yeah. Dark, dark nebulas and light nebulas, and um, you actually see little globular clusters and things like that. Okay. Even without, without telescopes. Without so. telescope. mm. Mm. We've come outside to see Rod's observatory, and he's just about to explain about his setup. Yeah, this is a uh, Newtonian reflector mm-hmm. with a 16-inch mirror, mm-hmm. and the observatory is uh, 2.4 metres in diameter. Okay. Which um, is a little bit squashy in here, so that's why I'm building a larger observatory. Yeah. And, and what does this current setup allow you to see? Yeah, well, I chose um, this mirror 16-inch because I wanted to look at uh, fainter objects, mm-hmm. so a uh, bigger aperture glass allows me to look, um, study the fainter stars, which not a lot of people look at. Mm. Rod's just about to give me a lesson in astronomy. Rod, what are we going to have a look at? Yeah, we're going to look at the uh, Southern Cross. Mm-hmm. And in the Southern Cross, there's this nice little object called the Jewel Box. Okay. It's an open cluster of pretty coloured stars. Mm-hmm. And there's also a bonus you actually see this um, with the naked eye. Okay. So if I just look through here. Yep. What we've experienced tonight is someone whose passion has become an obsession. And that obsession has led to an extraordinary contribution to science, even resulting in the, in the reclassification of stars. Rod's changed where he lives in a search for darkness, and he's fought against uh, the issues of, of light pollution. But I think the simple message is that he's encouraging people just to look up and, and to become more aware of everything around us. My name is Matt Sykes and this has been Land Talk.